Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you see the needs of your people as they would desire a touch from you and from your great throne of grace. Lord, for the ones that are going through things and for request upon people's hearts. May you touch them. May you, may you show them the way. Because, Lord, we know that you know our every need. And there's nothing that is, don't pass through your hands that you don't know. Father, I know that people pray and they think that you don't hear. But you do hear. And you do know about it. Just because it's not answered then, then, Lord, discouragement comes and people think that they haven't been heard. Lord, we see examples in your word of where people prayed and you showed your visitation for many years. I think about Joseph, Lord, the things that you showed him and all and what he had to go through in order to see the clearance, Lord, of what that you really promised him. Abraham, Lord, which is the father of the faithful. Lord, we look at him and what he had to go through in order to get the promise. And then when the promised son come, of what he had to go through with, Lord, to prove that not to him, prove not to you, but to prove to generations to come, even in our hour, that Lord, you're faithful to your promise. And forgive us our weakness, Lord, for not waiting as we should and being anxious and being troubled about things that, Lord, that you, in your mind, have already taken care of, but in our mind, we see no way out. Forgive us of these things, Lord. And help us to walk in close uh a proximity of you. Lord, we don't want to just walk in your presence, but we want your presence to be in us. Bless now your people as they have come out here this morning, the ones that have traveled far and the ones that are in uh, need of a touch of you this morning. Lord, we know that you know all about it. Help us now, Father, we pray in this service. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Brother Bo. It's good to, good to see you again this morning. I think I'm not connected. Maybe I am now. I've added a couple of scriptures on to what I already had. And uh, I'm just glad in... Uh, these services to see the anxiety of people as to the desire that they have to be able to see the accomplishments of God. In our midst and in these times that we're living in, knowing that God knows all of our needs and our situations and our trials and tests. 
I believe that the other day when I stopped reading, I was in Second Timothy. I will go back there as we begin this morning and uh, as we start the service, I'll... Uh, It was Second Timothy three. I'll just go ahead and read this again. I got down to maybe verse five. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, perilous times is things that we're living in now. We don't have to wait because uh, when Paul talked about he had been in, in perils of robbers, of perils of storms and things of that nature, he knew what perils was all about. But he had done uh, so many things to Christian people that whenever... God saved him. He was going to make him pay for it. In his flesh. Not in his spiritual walk with God, but in his flesh. And this is what it is with us. God can forgive you of every sin that you have ever done. And he will. But then there's a certain price in our flesh that God is going to sometimes make us go through in order to uh, pay for things that we have done. And in reference of that is Ananias come to pray for Paul or is God spoke to him before he ever come to pray for him. He questioned God about uh, Paul. It was Saul at the time. He questioned him. And uh, he said, uh, I know what he's done, how he's persecuted people and everything. But God said, he's a chosen vessel of mine, of mine but I'll show him what things he must suffer for my name's sake. And you come down to near the end of his life, you're going to find that he had uh, he tells the events of what he had gone through: shipwreck, beat with rods, stone, left for dead. Besides perils of robbers, shipwreck, all of these things that he went through, and. Uh, it was that way also in Brother Branham's life. I'm not saying that Brother Branham done a lot of things, but then the thing about it was whenever God called him, he's up northern Indiana. I mean, I, I mean, whenever God really spoke to him concerning his ministry. He was up in northern Indiana and he'd been to a meeting. And he preached up there in a tent meeting. They didn't know him, but he was the youngest preacher that was there. And they said that they were going to have him to preach. And he was very shy and backward about it. But then after he would got through preaching... He had all these people to come forward to him to uh, to give him their addresses that they wanted him to come preach for them all the way even into Texas. And uh, he was so happy about it that he went home and told his wife what had happened and his mother-in-law got a hold of it and so she... Uh, said, you're not going to take my daughter around all that, around that trash. That's what you called it. And uh, 
So it caused him to back off and not accept what he had been placed here to do. And when he tells his life story, he's the one that tells about that. That he listened to his mother-in-law and then he lost his wife and his little daughter. And he even tried to take his own life two different times and God wouldn't permit it. But he said that the way of a transgressor is hard. That was his own words. I didn't look at him in that way. I looked at him in a, as a man of God. But then, on the other hand, he had to pay for listening to somebody that was going to try to influence him. But his wife said, Bill, I'll go with you. But then an unbeliever, and that's what she was, an unbeliever. Unbelievers sometimes can influence people. And unbelievers can get in your way of progress. Because it is natural to listen to human flesh, but it is not spiritual. And we are to be spiritual people in this hour, not wondering why this one left and why that one left. And all of this that goes on is Brother Bud said the other night, or it might have been yesterday morning anyway, that there was a, a young girl that come here during the meetings that year and told some other young person that uh, that there's a bunch of people, preachers, that, that we're going to leave, that they wasn't going to come back. See, this was a made-up thing. I, I knew it was because... There's a man, certain man from Canada, of course he was against what that I had preached concerning the third day. He's, he was against that. But he let me know that there was three weeks ahead of time that there was preachers that were coming here that was going to convince me I was wrong. And uh, so these things, but you know, People that see Scripture, people that see a revelation, it is no problem for them uh, to be able to see what God is doing in that hour and it becomes simple to them. God's Word is not complicated to the child of God, but it is to tares and people that do not want to listen. And I know that people don't like it when you say things like that because uh, sometimes it goes against the flesh. But you know, everything has not always been roses for me. I never get into it, but I know what it is to go through things. But the thing about it is, my sisters told me one time, of which said I'd, I'd never thought about it, that I had a, a mind that I could more or less uh, put certain things in, in, in its place. And if we don't put certain things in a place to where that it don't affect our walk with God, we're going to be in problems. We're going to be in trouble, in other words. If we can't separate 
flesh from spirit. We're, we're not going to be able to see God working in our life as we should if we can't separate things. Compartmentalize our minds. Because we gotta, we got to have certain compartments in our mind that does not let us be hindered from what God is doing. If we don't, we're going to be troubled. And Satan is going to work on that one part of our mind because we have given him an avenue to be able to work. And I had a, a slide up here the other day concerning the, the founders of the Constitution. These men had differences. They were with different religious beliefs. But whenever they come together and argued and fussed for days, they all had to come together with one mind in writing up the Constitution of the United States because... Believe it or not, it was guided of God. I'm not talking about that bunch that we have up there now. I was thinking about it in this way. Especially the vice president of the United States. You can't hardly even let your children listen to the man. Because he's got a he he's got a triple X vocabulary. The man is like a rocket. You never know where he's going to go with his words. And people people that way were not the ones that wrote up the Constitution. If they had, it would have been an argument and nothing would ever have been settled because they can't settle anything in Washington anymore. And my message is leadership. And whenever we look at leadership, I'm looking at leadership in a way of the ministry. You've got to have leadership. And I may say this different times in this message. That God don't have a bunch of heads. He's got, he's got a pattern of the way that things are going the congregation is not going to tell the preacher what to preach. And the preacher is not going to tell himself what to preach. He's going to listen to God. If a man cannot listen to God, I mean, every once in a while I see a television preacher. And my, they're looking at the podium more than they are at the Bible. Because they got everything written down that they're going to say. Where does that give God a chance to work in the midst of a people? In the last days. When is the last days? Where, where are we going to put this in time? People always want to refer back to what Paul said as to where that he believed that he was in the last days. Because he said, we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not pre present them which are asleep. So he had his mind that it would be in his day but then, 
all the scriptures hadn't been compiled in a way that we have them today. You had you had to go back to Daniel chapter 9. Chapter 9 and along about 27 and so on to be able to find all of this that was going on because there was going to be 69 weeks. You don't change that. 69 weeks. And 69 weeks was when Jesus was crucified at the end of the 69 weeks, of which that we know that that started the three days. And people got a problem with that. But people with the revelation don't have a problem with that. You know, when I started school, I didn't know what two and two meant. But in a way, it was a revelation. When I, whenever I, because I got understanding of that, that is a physical resurrection. Revelation. But the physical, the, the natural man, he can understand these things, but when it comes into the Word of God, shut it up. We don't want to hear about the book of Revelation. The more, it's like a mud hole, they've, they've said. The more you stir it, the muddier it gets. But since 1960, when the church ages were preached, we've come down here to the end time, and really there's not a whole lot in Revelation that we don't understand. You say, well... Some may say, well, you're bragging. I'm not bragging. I'm bragging on God because He said in the last days, those that are wise will understand. He didn't say those that are educated. He said the wise will understand. But He said the evil will not understand. It just goes over their head because they don't have the capability in order to understand even though they're educated. And whenever I read that about the last days, I understand what it means because there's certain things that must happen before the end comes, but we're getting close to that time. These are indications. For men shall be lovers of themselves. They don't care about you. Especially if you're a Christian person, they don't care about you. We are a minority that nobody pays any attention to. But I am not after attention from the world because I'm not going to put my pearls before swine. Covetous. Boasters. Proud. Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, not even caring. It seems that in America, I don't know about Norway or whatever, but in America, every week you've got somebody on, on television that has 
taken some little child. I think that they're having to lock their doors a little more now in Norway than they did, but I, I remember just a few years ago they didn't even lock their doors. But then other people, they begin to let come in. Men that did not care. And that's America today. I remember when I was a boy, the, the key to the door was, you never knew where it was at. And everybody had the same key. You could go up and down, down the ridge where I live. That's why they call it a ridge as a road, but it was a taller place. You could go up and down the road and, and, and you could, anybody that had a, had a house, you could take your key and unlock their door. Whenever I said we lived on a ridge, I was thinking when we went to Canada a few years ago, five, six years ago. There was a place up there called High Point that we were on, and, and the rest of it was so level that they said you could see your dog. If it left home, you could see it for three days. And I said, High Point... And that's the only place that was higher than the rest was about four foot high. Where are you going with that? <laughs> I'm going to bring it back to the low point. Without. Natural affections. People will rob you. There was a woman on the news this morning. There's two women in a car decided to take her purse. One on the driver's side reached out and got her purse. And she thought in herself, you're not getting my purse. They took her through the parking lot about a hundred or a hundred and fifty feet. And finally they let her go because they didn't know that she was a black belt person. <laughs> They didn't, they didn't know that this old grandma here, here a while back in 70, 70 some years old, they didn't know that she had a baseball bat that she used when the robbers come in. <laughs> Brother Phil, there are just some people who won't take everything. And in saying that, God's got a ministry that's got a backbone today that is going to stand for truth if it means that somebody's going to walk away. You're not preaching to make people walk away, but truth, if truth makes people walk away, you can't help it. The Scripture says, are you going to obey God or man? Truth breakers. False accusers. Incontinent. Fierce. 
despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. People have got everything fixed up. These churches don't have church on Sunday night because they got other things to do. Well, I can't I can't go to church tonight and and it hit the preachers. We won't have service because somebody got a football game. Whenever these things, whenever things of the world begin to creep in and we think more of them than we do of living for God, then something is wrong. There used to be a saying, something is rotten in Denmark. I don't know why they had to say that. Why didn't they just say their own country? Something is rotten in America today. Having a form of godliness. Just a form. The saying that I used to hear when I began to hear it, watch, don't get too religious. People are so heavenly minded that they have no earthly benefit. I don't know too many people like that. There's a man that Brother Jackson used to uh, used to mention from North Carolina. Anybody would meet him on the road, and and he would always have something to say about God. So one day he lost something, and he had his horse and wagon going up and down the road looking for it and somebody come along said call him by name which I don't remember anymore call him by name and said uh, what are you looking for he said I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God went on down the road A form of godliness. They can put their sermons on on a billboard, what they're going to preach. You go in, listen to them. It's just a formality. A form. Nothing of substance. But denying the power thereof. I have been hearing some powerful messages this week. I saw a brother get so happy here last night that I was glad the floor was braced and I said it then and I say it again uh, this morning that's all right every everybody gets excited about this and that they go they go to a a, a 
some kind of a sporting event and they holler and yell and lose their voice and what they say, oh, this is fans. Somebody gets happy at church or something, they call them fanatics. It said, from such turn away. If you can't bring truth to me, if you can't bring a revelation to me, then I don't want it. Go to verse 7. Ever learning. And never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Brother and sister, what the Lord has showed me and what He showed you is not tradable. And my question was, when Brother Jackson died, what are we going to do? I begin to listen to the messages that he preached, I got them in, in video form. I got them and put them in my, in my truck as I went to work in tape form. And I begin to listen. And God began to speak to my heart. But the thing, the thing that happened when God begins to speak, He don't just talk to you about what has been said. Because the Bible said that that spirit that sits within you. Will lead you into all truth. He's going to take hold of you and he's going to lead you. And then after a while, he's going to guide you. A guide does not lead you. He points you the way. People are planning on going to Israel. You won't have somebody a hold of your hand. You'll have a guide. As we were going along on the bus, the first trip that we took, here is, he was a Jewish man that had been through the wars and everything. He was probably around 60 years old. And he had grown up in Israel and he had been through all the wars. We were driving along and he said, this is where Joshua fought a certain battle. I didn't know that. I would never have known it if he hadn't pointed it out. And you come into a little gully like that we would call here. A little indention here. This, this is where David killed Goliath. You know how David killed Goliath? 
He studied him out. Israel was on the opposite side of the hill. And Goliath, whenever he met David, the sun was shining toward him. And he had to pick up this little thing that was over his eyes there. David saw room. And when he saw, whenever he saw this, this guy said, here's where he got his stones. Everybody picked him up some little stones. (laughs) The little brook was dried up of where that it was at. Everybody picked them up some little stones. Everybody's going to be like David. (laughs) But David picked up those five stones. He wasn't going to need them all, but he put them in his little pouch. He said, here you come out after me, you little strapling. He was Rudy, little red-faced fella. But he walked out there against that mighty giant of which today we are a little group. Jesus told His disciples, O little flock! There was only eight that made it on the ark. Brother Jackson said there'll be hundreds in America go. There won't be thousands. All these airplanes are not going to fall from the air. As your denominational world says, millions. If it's going to be like that, oh, I tell you. The other night, they had a, awards that they were giving away. Dove awards. They should have been crow awards. <laughs> Vulture awards. Here come out these people. I didn't watch it. I saw a little bit of it. Here come out these people. Long hair. Hanging down in their eyes. You can't tell whether they're man or woman. Or whether they're beast. And I'd say most of them are. Come out. And this is gospel. You could have turned to MTV and got a better looking bunch of people. And I don't watch MTV. (laughs) David was a country music singer. (laughs) He sang to the sheep. (laughs) He wrote his psalms to the sheep. And he said, the Lord is my shepherd. Don't bring that kind of music to me. Because I don't want to hear it. Every week, I get somebody emailing me wanting to come to show our young people how to how to sing and how to perform. All the performance we need is the Holy Ghost. And all the inspiration we need is the Spirit of God to get into somebody to make their feet move. Make their hands go up. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord! 
I've seen him get in this little boy's knees. God bless you. And we're going to see more of it. We're going to see eight, nine years old children that are filled with the Holy Ghost. We never want to get the cart before the horse. Don't put healing above the message. These signs shall follow them that believe. You got to believe before you get the signs. Other words, you are a denomination. The denomination can tell you about healing, but they can't tell you about Jesus. If you can't talk to me about the healer, don't talk to me about healing. I've been healed. I had athletes feet so bad. Between my toes they bled. Wife well, heard on the radio something about a, a medication that would help. I sent and got that medication. It would help about three months and then it would come back again. One day, they thought that medication was too hard. They quit making it. I didn't have anything to put on my feet anymore. But anyway, I didn't need any more. Amen. God took Amen. care of it. Yes. Amen, brother. I went to Canada. We went to Canada in 1980. I had allergies so bad. Before I come to church, my eyes would get so red, and it it embarrassed me. They get so red, and I'd put this visine in there to make it make the red go away. But I had some medicine, about 60 pills. That was back before I knew anything about that it would make you sleepy. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I'd get so sleepy at work that I couldn't hardly stay awake and I was on a dangerous job. We went to Canada. In 1980, whenever we did, some way, somehow, my aftershave lotion got into my peels. And I looked, and it was just, it was just a green in the bottle. But after that, I didn't need the pills. My eyes are not red anymore. Don't tell me God is not a healer. But the thing about it is, this is not the important most thing. You can have your body healed and go to hell. You can have your body healed and you can walk away from truth. Let us get our priorities straight. Everybody's not going to walk away.
You take a little sister there that can stand against a tornado. Don't come here! Took everything about it around her. Killed a man just a little ways from her. But her house did stood. Give me somebody with faith in a anchored, anchored in God. Brother, sister, give me somebody like that. I don't care. They don't have to be a big person. They don't have to be somebody that gets up and testifies every service. They may be few words, but brother or sister, they got faith bigger than what I can mount. That'll keep you going in the in the bad times. Like I said the other morning, I hadn't planned going this way, but I did. Brother Bud, I'm not trying to touch on things that you say. I'm not trying to head anything off. If I can build on my brother's message. If I can build on my brother's messages. We used to have a little game that we would play. When I was a boy, give me your hand like this. Put your hand on top of mine. We'd do that, and then we'd pull them out. <laughs> we would pull them out till you got down to the end. Amen. That's what young people used to do. Yeah. Now then, they got to have... You see him going up and down the road. I saw a man the other day. He wasn't keeping in the road because he's looking at a paper. No wonder there's so many wrecks. No wonder there's so many religious wrecks. It's because people have got their mind on everything else instead of the gospel. There's a mess, but there's a message. And the message will bring you close to God. Brethren, You've been a great help in this hour. I know it. I'd say no more about that. But I know you have. But you know, all of us have got to face trials. The trial of your faith is more precious than that of gold, even though that it's been tried in the fire. Brother Bud and I, we used to say to one another when we preached on Thursday night, your time. Your time. I remember one time that Brother Jackson was sick and uh, come to church here and I hadn't studied a message. I thought he was well and Brother Bud, I, I thought that he would be preaching or something and I hadn't studied or nothing. And I got up here and led singing and all and I got ready to go back and get the water and and... I said, well, I'll turn it over to you. And Brother Bud said, I'm not preaching. 
Brother Jackson said, I'm not preaching either. (laughs) Is either get a hold of some Scripture and look and start from there or be lost like a ball in high weeds. I tell you, that's a test. (laughs) It so scared people to preach whenever Brother Jackson was on the platform. He was just a brother. A brother that was had a message. He was an apostle of God, but he put his paints on just like I did. He did. Sometime, brother, you just got to take the old cow by the tail. Because you got to hold on. Got to hold on to something. If you don't follow truth, you'll fall for anything. God has put enough in our hearts and in our minds in this hour that we don't have to be shook. We are shook because we are not settled. I'll tell you what, when I was a boy, and I better close. Whenever I was a boy, I liked to watch pigs. I'd climb up on the fence and I'd sit and watch them pigs. But you know, after a while, that fence got tired. Or I did. And I decided, I got to get off of this fence. Oh, it's so hard for some people to get off the fence. Because they don't know which way to go. Why? You get a revelation in your heart, you'll know which way to go. This message is not a guesswork. Or I hope so. Or could be. It could be this. It could be that. It can't be. It's got to be one way. You say your way, it's a Bible way. And I, if I didn't believe that I was walking in that Bible way, I'd close my Bible. But I know that it's true. I'm not shaking at all. No, sir. No, ma'am. I'm not shaking. Brother Jackson preached a message that God would shake all things. Come right from the Scripture. And there has been a shaking going on. When that shaking is over, it's about over. We're about running out of time. God's going to come back for a perfect church. Without spot. Without wrinkle. Without blemish. I know I've said that. I've thought about putting something on my shirt, come in here and preach. But you know what? You know what would happen? Everybody'd look, be looking at that spot. <laughs> Why don't he put a little dab on there? A little dab will do it. That's the way it is with religion. People got a little dab. Why don't we just jump in 
and take a bath in the Word of God and it will leave us to where we will be anchored. If I don't quit, we'll be running into night service. I believe I could because you all are absorbing it. But I won't. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this day that you've given us. Bless now thy people, Father. Your little children, Lord, that have come to be a part of something that is true. Forgive us, Lord, of our shortcomings. May we walk humbly and honestly before you. Bless your children, Father. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You all are dismissed.